Buonasera a tutti, benvenuti al nostro ultimo appuntamento delle lingue live. Siamo anche questa volta in compagnia della persona che ha dato inizio a questa avventura che è stata molto bella e molto soddisfacente, Silvia Chini, che saluto, intanto la vedremo con te. Eccola qua. Ciao, Ciao Laura. Silvia, sì, ci cioè, hai accompagnato quasi sempre dall'inizio alla fine, quindi sono molto contenta di chiudere con te. È Chiudiamo questa sera in attesa poi della ripresa di settembre, perché vi riaccompagneremo eh, all'inizio di scuola, ma prima ci prenderemo tutti i meritate vacanze delle quali abbiamo bisogno. Eh, L'incontro di questa sera parla di Society, Hope or Fear. Allora, come è raffigurata la società nelle opere letterarie dall'inizio del XX secolo fino ad oggi? Io, come sempre, lascio la, parola, lascio la parola a Silvia che vi porta a spasso per una quarantina di minuti intorno a eh, idee, spunti, idee di progetto, sperimentazioni varie, contenuti. Raccolgo nel mentre le domande che vorrete rivolgerle e che potete scrivere o inquadrando il QR code che vedete adesso sullo schermo oppure digitando alla pagina domande, punto page, eccetera, che di tanto in tanto reinseriremo, raccolgo il tutto e poi alla fine del, del racconto di Silvia, eh, prima di salutarci, ne parliamo un po'. Quindi le lascio la parola e auguro a tutti buona lezione. Grazie ancora Silvia. Good afternoon everybody. As usual I'm happy to be here and to have the possibility to share some ideas with colleagues. Uh, today we speak about society, society hope or fear. So the idea that literature reflects society is at least as old as Plato and his concept of imitation. But uh, to be honest, the beginning of the systematic approach and application of the idea is with Madame de Stel, with the book uh, De la Literature. Uh, basically, the author offered the social and historical interpretations of the literature of several nations. So in the next 40 minutes, I will try to give you some ideas uh, on how to deal with this topic, a uh, thematic approach, uh, how to deal with society in literature, society through literature and literature through society. But to start with, we need to understand what a society is. Uh, well, if you work in the Liceo delle Scienze Umane, you can go on speaking about society for ages. Uh, but if you, if you work in any other school, you can ask your students to uh, define society. And they will come up with ideas such as society is a group of people, people sharing some values. These are some of the things that my students generally say. A group in the same geographical location, a group sharing a place. But since we all know that society is more than a group of people, Uh, sharing some traditions, a group of people sharing a geographical location, we know that literature can be considered the mirror of society. Because literature reflects um, its values, so the values of our society, but also its difficulties, uh, its ills. Um, literature all, often presents a picture of what people say, what people think, what people do in real life. And so let's move on with the first author, the first writer. And the first one is one of the pillars of our uh, fifth year programs, James Joyce. So such was the impact of his literary revolution that few later novelists, but also I would say singers, uh, film directors, and in some cases, even poets have escaped the aftershock. Uh, apart from all the things we know about Joyce, fragmentation of word and image, multiple point of view, uh, open-ended na narrative, and all the things, as I said before, we know uh, he introduced, he introduced uh, the so-called grandeur of ordinary life. So he was super interested in ordinary people, ordinary life. Think about the famous sentence we all know, if Dublin one day suddenly disappeared from Earth, it could be reconstructed out of my book. Uh, this was referred to um, Ulysses, but it can be used even for other books because, as we know, Joyce emigrated when uh, decided to leave Dublin in body but never in mind. So uh, why not starting analyzing Joyce, uh, starting from his society, Irish society in his period, in his time? So the link you see here and the picture, the image, Google Earth, you see here, uh, it's the link of a project. Uh, it's a project that gives you the possibility to explore Joyce's works 
through the geographical locations and the specific places in Dublin listed or involved in his novels or short stories, The Dubliners. So this is a good way to introduce Joyce, starting from uh, geography in a way. Or if you teach in a turistico, you can start from the guided tours that even nowadays, if you go to Dublin, you can join. So if you go to Dublin now, unfortunately not now, but nowadays, uh, you find guided tours that lead you uh, and make you un realize, understand, discover the places used by Joyce in uh, his works. So why not starting uh, with uh, the places described in his novels? Uh, this is a possible way to explore uh, Joyce's works. And uh, if you want uh, to engage your students, uh, if you want to um, follow the, the path of starting for, uh, from what your students know, I would suggest this website. We're making an experiment now. I will stop sharing my screen and I will ask you to get your mobile phone and to follow uh, the instructions. So this is a good website. It's called Mentimeter. Uh, probably you know it. It's a website that gives you the possibility to create interactive presentations. If you get your mobile phone, you go on www.menti.com, as you can see here, and use the code 56486177, the one you see here. Uh, you can answer my question. The question is, what do you associate with Dublin? Since we're speaking about Joyce, Joyce's society, and we're taking into consideration Joyce's works, we can start from what our students know. So now, if you try this with me, you will have first-hand experience of this great website. This is a good thing. If you type, you have the possibility to type up to three words that you associate with Dublin. Now we're waiting for some um, people. Good. Irish atmosphere. As you can see, as soon as you type it, uh, it appears on the screen. This is even good for Didattica Digitale Integrata if you have classes at home or part of the class at home and part of the class in class. Paralysis, great, good job. So you can really engage your students and you can start from what your students know. Ireland, that's great. You can start and can you see here? The more you write, the more the word cloud um, uh, is shaped, let's say, on the screen. And I'm sure you will see this. Uh, the more you type the same word, so the word, the same word is repeated, the bigger it is. The biggest one here in this case is paralysis. So it means that you, a lot of you, uh, have typed paralysis. This is a great thing to engage your students. And this is a good way to start from what your students know. We're not, I'm sorry, we're not waiting every single answer. It was just a way to show you how to engage Guinness. I love this answer. Uh, beer, good. Uh, you can start from what your students know. And why not taking into consideration answers such as Guinness, beer, shops, uh, potatoes and other things, uh, pubs, good, and other things, to see how these places, Irish places, places in not Dublin have been uh, treated, have been uh, described in Joyce's works. It's a good thing. I'm happy you're typing and typing again. Uh, so I'm just um, interrupting the presentation to show you that you can choose a lot of types of interactive questions, multiple choice, scales, ranking, open-ended, question and answer, select and answer, heading, paragraph, everything. This is a good way to uh, engage your students and to start with. So let's start from what you've, uh, some of the things you've written. I stop sharing the screen and I would go back to the presentation. So it's really a good way, really engaging. My students love uh, Mentimeter. So let's go back to the presentation now. Good. Um, as you can, you have some examples here. It's free. Uh, at least the, the um, okay first basic version is free, and you can you can create really engaging slides for your students. So as you've understood probably, um, and we've started speaking about Dublin, we will concentrate on Dubliners, uh, something we all do in the fifth year. Uh, the pictures you see here are taken from Litab by Rizzoli, but you can use the book you have, obviously. 
um, as I said before, we all know that Joyce left Ireland in body but not in mind. So think about Ireland in 1914. So Dublin was the second city of the empire. The third home rule bill has been postponed because in August, UK went to war against Germany. And this left, left both unionists and nationalists uh, wondering what action would be best for them. And as you've said in the word cloud we've just seen together in Mentimeter, um, what Joyce criticized is Irish conservatism, blinkered nationalism, paralysis. We, we all know he blamed uh, British government and the church. And so why not going from Joyce's society to Joyce's works? So uh, the hypocrisy of Irish nationalism is criticized in Gabriel's argument with Miss Ivers at the beginning. And you see the two quotations here taken from the dead, the last short story of the collection. Uh, at the beginning, well, yes, at the beginning of the story when they are dancing uh, and there is the argument with Miss Ivers on the um, newspaper. So Gabriel writes for an English newspaper. And the second part, uh, they are deciding where to go on holiday and Miss Ivers wants to go to the Iron Island. We all know the western part of the Ireland, one of the most conservative places. And Gabriel wants to go to the, country, to the continent, so Germany, France. And she asks um, why, the reasons why. So as you can read here, and haven't you your own language to keep in touch with, your own culture, so Irish. Well, said Gabriel, if it comes to that, you know Irish is not my language. And starting from this sentence, you can speak about uh, the Irish revival. You can speak about the situation in Ireland, unionists and nationalists. You can go back to Irish society and Irish history. But throughout the stories, this is another one we generally do in class, uh, we meet a series of characters who are paralyzed, as you said before, they're desperate, they're unable to choose, like this girl who, is, uh, who can't decide whether to go or not. Um, we both have a physical and spiritual death, both in the dead. Think about Gabriel, think about Michael Fury, he's physically dead but spiritually alive, while the opposite, Gabriel, is physically alive but spiritually dead. So that's the perfect representation of Irish society in 1914. Um, that's the perfect way to describe uh, Irish society and to link the works to history and uh, to, yes, society of that period, not just speaking about the home rule bill, but also speaking about the past. You've, spo you've typed uh, potato famine. That's a good way to start, a great way to start. So you can go back and forth to society, history, and literature, and then from literature to uh, history and um, society. And since we're speaking about paralysis, uh, you can engage your students with a sort of an oxymoron. Uh, so why not exploring paralysis through escape rooms? So Evelyn is, can't decide whether to go or not. Gabriel is paralyzed. Ireland is paralyzed. And we explore paralysis through escape rooms. Unfortunately, we don't have time here to speak about escape rooms, but I'm sure you know how to do it. Just one thing, uh, you can use Google modules. It's super easy. You can create some questions. As you can see here, if you click on the, um, on the icon here, you can choose Google modules and you can, find, you, can, you can simply type some questions and you can create an escape room. And it is good for Didattica Digitale Integrata. It is also good for the flipped classroom. And you will give your students the possibility to explore both society and literature at the same time. So you can ask them, for example, in the first part to explore something about the short story you've analyzed in class. Then you, in the second part, they link the short story to society, Irish society in that period. That in, then in the third part, they can link society and history. So it's a good way for your students to explore autonomously, I would say, too. Um, literature and society. Uh, well, it happened in history that uh, society had to face difficult periods. Think about even our period with the pandemic. Uh, but think about war. In one of our webinars, we've spoken about war literature. Think about terrorist attacks, 9-11. 
think about natural disasters. Uh, Katrina, for example, obviously literature has always reproduced those difficulties in its own way. And the author I want to speak about now, the example I want to give you now is George Orwell. Completely different period, completely different author. Um, in his essay, Why I Write, as you can read from the quotation here, he says, when I sit down to write a book, I do not say to myself, I'm going to produce a work of art. I write it because there is some lie that I want to expose. As you can see, Orwell is linked to his society. Think about his life. He had the possibility, unfortunately, to experience the First World War, the Second World War, uh, the Cold War. And so he had the possibility to put some of his experiences in fiction. So his novel, 1984, is another a pillar of our programs in the fifth year. And it's a great way to uh, create projects with your uh, colleagues, art history, history, if you work in a liceo linguistico, even German colleagues or um, um, history colleagues, but even Italian co colleagues who teach Italian. Uh, so his novel 1984 is so relevant even now that, um, uh, well, I would like to give you some ideas in this sense. To start with 1984, you can start, depending on your students, you can start from music or from commercials. The commercial you see here is the one made by Apple in 1984. So they used the novel to uh, advertise the first Macintosh. And you can start from the, from the commercial, or you can start from the songs of the album by the Eurythmics, the group, uh, called 1984, so inspired by Orwell. So think about the period in which 1984 was written. Think about the content of 1984. And we can relate all this content to real facts, history, things that really happened, and that, in a way, uh, Orwell had the possibility to experience. So this section, I called this section from fiction to fact, from fact to fiction, because you will explore with your students and you will understand how much fact we can find in fiction, in this case at least. So, uh, as I said before, think about the period in which 1984 was written, so in 1948-49. So right at the end of the Second World War, London, London was bombed, destroyed, destroyed buildings, debris everywhere, uh, rationing. So it was not an easy situation. And we can soon find, at the very beginning of the novel, we can find the same situation in London, the London of Winston Smith. So he tried to squeeze out some childhood memory that she'll tell him whether London had always been quite like this. So debris everywhere, as I said before, destroyed city. London in Airstrip 1 is constantly at war. And London, in the period in which Orwell wrote this novel, uh, was at the end of the Second World War. And so they had to build it from scratch, basically. This is the first link you can have with your history teachers or your history colleagues, sorry, uh, or for history. Uh, always in the first chapter, we read something like this. At the end, at one end of it, so the corridor, a colored poster too large for indoor display had been tacked uh, to the wall. So it depicted the big brother. Uh, in the book, in Lit Hub, you will find a connection with uh, contemporary dictatorships because dictatorships have not disappeared. So the Big Brother still exists uh, in, some, in some way, in some countries. And why not linking the Big Brother to contemporary situations, contemporary societies? This is an example you have in Lit Hub, but you can create your own lesson. Uh, the, the example you have here is South Korea, but obviously we don't have just South, uh, North Korea, sorry, North Korea. It's not the only one. So you can create links to contemporary societies. And if you want to work with your history colleagues, once again, you can concentrate on totalitarian societies in history. So uh, the poster, the poster, as I said before, at the end of the corridor, a colored poster. So posters is always, uh, have always played an important role in totalitarian societies. Here you can see some examples taken from um, totalitarian societies in history. Uh, one is from Nazi Germany, the other one is from uh, Eastern Germany after the Second World War, and another one from contemporary North Korea. And 
so you can show your students, you can work with your students, trying to understand the importance of colors, the importance of uh, pictures, and the importance of slogans and posters, propaganda posters, and throughout history. This is a great project I did with my fifth year students last year, and they were super engaged. So seeing that fiction is not just fiction, but there's so much fact in fiction is something that uh, they always find interesting. And uh, going on with the chapter, we have the description of Winston's apartment. And we can read that um, he had a telescreen in his apartment with a voice coming from the oblong metal plaque and they couldn't uh, see whether the telescreen was transmitting or recording or both at the same time. So they were constantly spied. So why not speaking about technology in totalitarian societies? Once again, think about Nazi Germany and the loudspeakers everywhere. Think about Eastern Germany, so uh, after the Second World War. And this is a great movie, I always watch it with my students, uh, that speaks about the situation in Eastern Germany um, after the Second World War. So spies, microphones everywhere. But even now, think about internet censorship. We all know that Winston Smith works for the Ministry of Truth. So basically, he cuts and pastes things and he puts together things uh, that can be published, not censored. And uh, the same thing happens in some countries. Uh, for example, here you have, you have uh, an infographic with 10 of the countries that now, in this moment, nowadays in the world, have internet censorship. This is a project I'm doing right now with my fifth year students. So trying to understand how censorship has changed throughout history and going from fiction to fact, once again, and from fact to fiction, uh, because I'm dealing with Orwell and I'm teaching Orwell in this moment. So these are just some examples. Somebody, uh, some states, some countries have internet censorship to impose, as you can see here, traditional social values, others to keep political stabilities and others to maintain national security. They generally know North Korea, but they don't, do not realize that there are a lot of countries with internet censorship. And it's a good way to link, once again, literature to society, not just the society of that time, but even our society nowadays. And since we're speaking about uh, language and internet, I would like to spend a couple of minutes for the slogan of the party, because once you uh, go through the novel and you get to the chapter, uh, well, this slogan is in the first chapter, but once you get to the chapter uh, that speaks about Newspeak, you realize how important is language for a totalitarian society. And, uh, well, to be honest, yes, to, uh, language is probably the most powerful weapon and we also we'll always read the slogan, war is peace, slavery is freedom, ignorance is strength. So oxymorons put together. So language is used to uh, transmit, to, um, to give the citizens the ideas and the ideals of the party. So this happened in history. Uh, our students are familiar with the first picture, the inscription um, at the entrance of every single concentration camp. Work and you will be free. We all know that that's not true. And so you can start working with your colleagues and uh, both uh, Ger German colleagues, even Italian, even history, but also with uh, Scienze Umane. If you work in a Liceo delle Scienze Umane, this is a good project to do with your Scienze Umane colleague. So how language has been manipulated in history in totalitarian societies. Uh, so uh, on the left, uh, sorry, on the right, uh, you can see uh, a picture, a list of some of the words that were manipulated and transformed in Italian during uh, the period before the Second World War. So this is just an example. But if you work in a liceo linguistico, you can, um, you can work with your colleagues uh, if they teach Germany, just to give you some ideas. In Eastern Germany, after the Second World War, English words were banned. So they had to replace them. Obviously, the two Germanies spoke German, but it was slightly different. So it's one of the best cases to uh, deal with with your students if you work in a liceo linguistico. So, for example, instead of DJ, they couldn't say DJ. So they had to find another, another word, Schallplatten und Halter, or hamburger, hot dog, Kitwurst instead of hot dog. So common words have been replaced. 
this is the same thing that is going on in the in 1984. So Winston and Syme, his colleague, uh, uh, the colleague is working on the 11th edition of the uh, Newspeak Dictionary. So this is the same thing that happened in Germany after the Second World War. Even dictionary dictionaries were separated for a certain period. And the last example I always give to my stu uh, give my students. Uh, so driving license, driving license was uh, Führerschein, but we all know that Führer was the word used for uh, Hitler. So uh, it couldn't be used in the eastern part of Germany after the Second World War, and so they had to find another word, Fahrerlaubnis. In this case, we still have Fahrerlaubnis in German nowadays, but it just to give your students the idea of how language has been manipulated. And why not taking examples uh, from now in our society? Italy, Italy, Italy right now, Italian society, um, current affairs, basically. It's something good even for civics. This idea of manipulation and totalitarian societies and freedom and censorship is good even for civics. And we all know that we need a lot of ideas for civics uh, now. Uh, but since, well, English literature is not only literature written by uh, English authors, I would like to virtually fly to the United States. Uh, there are so many novels to, you can take into consideration to speak about um, American society. Uh, here you can see some, some of them are um, super popular. Uh, on the road, so the big generation gives you the possibility to speak about uh, a lot of countries in the United States. Uh, a lot of states, The Great Gatsby, The Roaring Twenties, and The Help. The Help is really popular, especially the film. It is a great novel. It is not difficult. I generally use it with my fifth year students, and it's great to speak about the 60s in the United States. Um, it's good because it's written by basically four different narrators, and even the writing style is different. So you can, you can show your students even differences in English, written English in that period, um, because English is different according to the narrator of the, the chapter. Um, the Ever After Bird is great, uh, super easy. I generally use it with my third year students, even second year in some cases. And um, it speaks about always the United States, of course, but it speaks about the Underground Railroad. So it's a great way to speak about plantations, slaves, but especially the Underground Railroad, which is not really known, which is something our students generally don't know. And it gives you the possibility to speak about that society, the society in that period, through songs, gospel songs, uh, videos. There are a lot of videos about the Underground Railroad and uh, even quilts, so uh, pictures and paintings and drawings. It's a great book, in my opinion. Then we have another dystopian novel, if, you, if your students like dystopian novels, The Man in the High Castle, this time in the United States, not in London, as 1984, and the United States basically uh, lost the war, and the United States are divided between Nazi Germany and Japan. So it's a dystopian novel, uh, not too easy, but really interesting. Or um, the last one, which is absolutely popular, Don DeLillo, A Falling Man, so the terrorist attacks. 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks. Uh, it's not that easy because of the different perspectives of the book and because students generally, uh, when they start reading, they, they, they want to read something about the terrorist attack, 9-11. But the description of the terrorist attack comes at the end of the book. So they're a bit uh, confused at the beginnings. But it's a great book if you want to speak about society uh, before and after the terrorist attacks in... Um, the United States. Uh, but since uh, I've taken into consideration prose, so uh, in the first part of this webinar, I would like to speak about poetry. And I would like to uh, speak about America uh, through the eyes and the words of two poets, the American bard, so Walt Whitman, and Allen Ginsberg, born in 1926, so a poet of the Beat generation. They both depict America, obviously, in two completely different ways, in two completely different periods, uh, but they are linked in a way. So let's start with the first one. Um, I hear America singing Walt Whitman. Uh, Walt Whitman is considered the American bard. We all know it because he was born after American independence. Uh, he's considered the sort of a... Uh, 
an outsider because it's part of transcendentalist, but he was interested in everything. If you read his collection, Leaves of Grass, I always read it with my students. Uh, it's amazing because he's interested, as I said, in everything, society, nature, religion, uh, democracy, uh, philosophy, everything, really everything. So it's a great, great way to speak about American society because if you read that collection, you have American society in, in it. And I Hear America Singing is one of the poems I like the most, uh, starting from the title. Uh, the title, well, the meaning of the title is much more deeper than just American freedom. It is about the people who forge America. Uh, it is about the people who make America sing. I Hear America Singing. So the poem comes up at the very beginning of the collection, Leaves of Grass. And the first part of the collection is focused on the economic growth before, um, uh, before the Great Depression. And, uh, well, as you can see in the poem, there's no visible uh, hint on political issues. Uh, no prime ministers are mentioned, no president, no president is mentioned, nothing. We have common people. We have the people who really are forging America in that period. We have mechanics, we have the carpenter, we have mason, the boatman, the shoemaker, the woodcutter, uh, the mother. And they are all singing. That's the miracle uh, Whitman is describing. The miracle lies within the construction of America. And the miracle is that America can't be mm, built um, by the minority who leads the country. But uh, it comes, the miracle comes from the majority, the majority common people, middle class, uh, ordinary people who forge, really forge America. And they're super happy to forge it, to build it, because they're singing. So this is a great poem to speak about that period. This is, the collection is a good way to start speaking about the United States in that period. You have the first poem of the collection, One Self I Sing, is a great poem. And then speaking about Walt Whitman, you also have a captain, my captain. So as you can see, Whitman is so uh, polyedric. So he's, he's an icon of his time because he really represents his society. And once again, if you want to engage your students, uh, this, this game, but also the previous one, Mentimeter, can, can be used also for your language lessons, to be honest. Uh, the previous one, if you're revising, for example, vocabulary, you can, you can ask your students to create a um, cooperative word cloud. In this case, I, will, I would like to show you another website. It's called Gamey Lab. As you can see from the, uh, as you can see from the picture here, uh, this is a website that gives you the possibility to create a lot of games. Uh, games based on something like SimCity, something like Candy Crush, something like uh races it's really a good uh tool uh to engage your students and to work even with your students in didattica distanza uh your students were at home so i stop sharing once again my screen and i will share um the website with you uh this time um this game i've chosen uh, a literature race okay my students are even better uh, so this is a normal race, and as you can see here, competitors will answer correctly to get points for the class. So they play individually on their own, but they get points for the class. So just click on play. I will try to play, okay, but I'm not that good, just to tell, just to show you how it works. Okay, you play with your keyboard, so, or your mouse, you can play too, and you move in this case, uh the bice okay as you can see here that's the first question you can choose you can you can make your own questions uh what is an author in this case okay and i've chosen the option to ask the same question twice because uh this was for a first uh, second year so i wanted to uh, i wanted them to focus on the answer and once the answer is right you go to the other question so a biography is in this case okay and once again, but you can choose to make questions only once. And once you've answered, you get points for uh, for your class. Okay, you get some strength. Oh, sorry, I could crash. Okay, I'm not that good at playing, but I, I'm. I hope uh, you've seen how it works, and uh, your students can play. 
and they can gain, gain points by answering the questions. You can focus on a single poem. Now, this is a general uh, race about literature, okay? You can focus on a single poem, you can focus on a single novel, you can do whatever you want. In this case, fiction is, and then uh, we have no time to play. But I hope you will find this um, website interesting and useful even for your lessons. And obviously, you can do it for language too. Uh, so if you want to revise grammar, you can uh, make some. You can ask something about grammar. If you want to revise uh, vocabulary, you can ask something about vocabulary, and that's great because you can create a lot of different games. Okay, and the other thing that I find interesting is that they play on their own, but they are cooperating. It's a, um, some some of the features of gamification. So they're cooperating to reach a common goal. Um, that's that's a good website, I think. But going back to uh, our American society, uh, so the second uh, poem I wanted to uh, present is the one by Allen Allen Ginsberg, uh, a supermarket in California. So um, once again, we have uh, American society. One hundred years later, okay, Ginsberg enters the supermarket in California, obviously and has a vision of Whitman, okay? Whitman seems an alien in this supermarket because this supermarket, um, well, he doesn't understand, basically. This supermarket doesn't make sense in his 19th century American society. But anyway, if he doesn't understand the meaning, if it, the supermarket doesn't make sense, um, he is a sort of a guide for the poet, for Ginsburg. And the question here is, uh, has America gone too far with consumerism? So the supermarket is the icon of consumerism, okay? In this case, America is not presented through the people, common people, ordinary people who are forging America. So the carpenter working, the mason, the boatman working and singing. In this case, America is presented through goods. So 100% cons consumerism. And, well, the question is, has America gone too far? Has America lost its capacity to forge a nation, to love, to sing while forging the nation? So while Whitman was speaking 100 years before about workers, here we are in the middle of a supermarket, so we're, we only can see goods. Uh, is this all what America can offer? No, this is the question. And this is a question asked by the poet, too. We can clearly see, comparing the two poems, we can clearly see two Americas, okay, how American society has changed. And this is a great way to show how much the American society has changed. And always speaking about things you can do with your colleagues, you can work on pop art, uh, you can work on consumerism now in the United States, but not just in the United States. Why not speaking about Black Friday or all the things that we have now even in Italy? So this is a good way to think about, um, to also think about our society, Italian society. So how has it changed throughout history? And speaking about English literature and American society, comparing Whitman and Ginsburg is a great way to show your students how America has changed throughout history. So uh, since we have no time left, basically, and I really want you to uh, have time uh, to ask whatever you want, uh, I would like just to give you some, uh, a couple of hints more, uh, ideas. And one is another website you can use uh, to turn things into games, basically. This time, uh, the website is called Flippity. It's super easy to use, really super easy. You can transform um, Google modules into uh, games. You can create flashcards, you can create show, uh, quiz shows, you can create treasure hunts, you can create word search, you can create whatever you want. And there's a template, you just fill in the words you, you want your students to practice, all the questions you want to ask, and the website transforms your uh, questions into a game. It's a great thing, even for literature, even for fifth-year students, in my opinion, especially in this situation, uh, if they're following from home and they're tired of Didattica Digital Integrata, and we all know these things. So it's a good way to engage them, even for literature. 
The last thing I want to uh, show you is uh, a novel. I know that, uh, that I've said uh, I want you to concentrate on poetry, but this is great in my opinion. We've spoken about the help, which is super popular, but I think that even The Secret Life of Bees is a great novel to speak about uh, American society. Uh, the Secret Life of Bees, unfortunately, is uh, less popular, but uh, the novel is not difficult. Uh, you can read it with your students, or you can also read uh, just some chapters. And um, it's interesting, in my opinion, because American society is described through uh, bees, the secret life of bees. So there is uh, a family. Okay, well, you can see the sisters here. And Rosaline, this one, is a beekeeper. So she manages to explain, and the author manages to explain, uh, American society through bees and the secret life of bees. So what happens in the hive? And the other reason why I find this uh, novel interesting is that um, the perspective is uh, different from the help. So in this case, we have Lily, this girl, uh, who moves to Tiburon and she lives with uh, the sisters, okay? And she can see racism in the 60s in the United States from another perspective. So at the very beginning, she's the only one who is the only white person in this family. But then she manages to see uh, racism under, well, another point of view. Uh, she's a teenager, so she doesn't understand a lot of things. And she has a boyfriend, and her boyfriend, Zach, is um, a black lawyer to be. And, um, well, she, she really has the uh, feeling at the beginning, she, she doesn't understand. She can't understand a lot of things. And uh, she's almost the age of our students. That, that's why, that's the reason why I find uh, this novel interesting. And once again, it gives you the possibility to speak about the 60s in the US. So you can work with a lot of colleagues. You can speak about the Vietnam War. You can speak about Kennedy. You can speak about music. You can speak about Jim Crow laws. You can speak about a lot of different things. And we all know how... Um, important is linking English literature to other subjects in the fifth year, especially for the new maturita. So these are some ideas that really give you the possibility to uh, link uh, literature, English literature, to something else. It can be history, it can be scienze umane, it can be music, it can be contemporary societies, but really it gives the possibility to, uh, your it gives your students the possibility to um, to, to realize that literature is not something old-fashioned and is dead, it's there in the books just to read when you have nothing to do. But literature is something relevant, something live even nowadays, something alive even nowadays. And last but not least, I'm sure you all know this uh, movies. So if you want to speak about the 60s once again in the United States, um, I would suggest these movies. So the first one is a bit old, but my students always love watching Good Morning Vietnam. Uh, it's basically Vietnam War, a war uh, sorry, um, from another point of view. And The Butler is a great movie, not just to speak about the 60s in the United States, but to start from history, to start from the past, and to speak about American society throughout time, through time. Then we have JFK, and then we have Selma with um, the good possibility to link it to, uh, once again, Shinsu Mane and um, even why not if you work in the Liceo delle Scienze Umane you can speak with your colleagues teaching Economia Diritto and you can also uh, link some uh, topics for civics so we can speak for ages about society and literature literature and society because as I said at the beginning literature is the mirror of society and um, in my opinion the most important thing is making our students understand that literature represents society even nowadays and so we can understand a lot of things reading a book not just what the author thinks not just what the, how the author uh, the author writes but a lot of things about the period in which the book was written and this is a great way in my opinion to engage your students because they understand that literature is linked not just because we're speaking about movements okay romanticism uh, modernism but because it's there there's so much fact in fiction, and uh, it's a good possibility even for their maturita. They will have a lot of things to speak about. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation, and I'm really um, I'm waiting for your, hands, uh, your questions.
Allora, eccoci qua Silvia, allora pronta, <ride> pronta, allora grazie come sempre dei mille spunti e anche di farci conoscere di volta in volta delle cose come Mentimer, Mentimer o non so bene dove cada l'accento che, che si possono usare in classe con una certa facilità. Allora, un po' di commenti, un po' di domande. Allora, qualcuno dà per spunto ehm, Joyce's Paralysis and Coronavirus Pandemic, Connections and Similarities. Dice eh, è un bellissimo spunto, è, è sicuramente noi siamo paralizzati in un certo senso in questo momento, quindi eh, collegare quello che era ovviamente per due motivi completamente diversi, ma quello che era la paralisi nell'Irlanda di Joyce e quella che è la paralisi secondo Joyce e la paralisi che abbiamo oggi tutti noi eh, per tutta una serie di motivi che purtroppo ben conosciamo sicuramente è un bellissimo spunto. Eh, Magari mh, per tutti, certamente, ma al liceo delle scienze umane mi viene da dire che si possa indagare a un livello più profondo, certo. eh, perché adesso a parte con le lezioni di educazione civica, ma al liceo delle scienze umane proprio si va a indagare eh, questa, questa dinamica, quello che ci sta accadendo, quindi sicuramente è un bellissimo spunto. A questo punto Silvia mi leggo ad, ad, ad un tuo accenno al liceo delle scienze umane perché appunto qualcuno che probabilmente insegna al liceo delle scienze umane chiede I'd like to have some suggestions about authors dealing with suicide and society, se ti viene in mente qualcosa. Allora, um, suicide and society, uh, sui due piedi non mi viene in mente niente. Uh, mi vengono in mente autori che sicuramente possono essere interpretati su più livelli uh, anche per tutto un discorso non lo so, non c'entra uh, assolutamente niente con quello che abbiamo detto adesso ma uh, prendere in considerazione Mary Shelley su eh, tutto il discorso etico uh, prendere in considerazione il doppio adesso mi viene in mente questo perché eh, da noi al liceo delle scienze umane tra poco avremo la settimana, si chiamano i mad days, quindi utilizziamo alcuni giorni per parlare di, mh, su tutti i livelli, tutte le materie sono coinvolte, eh, per parlare di follia e eh, problematiche in questo senso al liceo delle scienze umane, quindi anche parlare di un doppio sul perito, c'è un nome di, cioè il nome di Silvia Plath che è stato ah beh, sul certo, perito. Sì. Certo, eh. mi veniva in mente. E, e quindi, quindi sicuramente ci sono tantissimi autori che è possibile indagare a più livelli. Poi eh, ovviamente tutti eh, i colleghi lo sapranno meglio di me, ma eh, dare un taglio eh, a seconda del liceo dove si insegna è la cosa che più eh, incoraggia i ragazzi a seguire, quindi ecco sicuramente eh, questo sì. Ecco, poi. Eh, dunque, poi continuano appunto, continuano in realtà gli spunti sui CD, ce ne sono molti. <ride> In realtà, Virginia Woolf e Septimus, Beh, certo. esempio, e comunque appunto chi ci segue sta leggendo ovviamente appunto Virginia Woolf e non solo, Thomas Harding, uh, Jude the Obscure, eccetera, però ecco, chi ci, chi ci continua a seguire? Grazie, eh, è bello questo scambio, anche che che però non, ci possiamo, non raccogli, ci possiamo parlare, non ci possiamo vedere. <ride> allora, senti, eh, un'altra cosa abbastanza interessante su cui secondo me gli studenti possono trovare uno stimolo piuttosto semplice, eh, per, per pensarci su eh, qualcuno scrive we are willingly giving our privacy away what would George Orwell uh, have said però appunto su, e su questo io aggiungo ignorance is strength e aggiungo ancora Silvia poi ti lascio la parola per un commento tutto quello che tutto sommato continua a far parte dell'educazione civica e che è in qualche modo sicurezza identità digitale eccetera sono temi non sovrapponibili però forse raccoglibili sotto certi spunti che possono far da traino in classe? Sicuramente sì e partendo proprio dall'esperienza dei ragazzi questa è una cosa, a me, io l'ho fatto in classe e mi è capitato di, di parlare proprio di questo proprio partendo da Orwell eh, sono proprio coinvolti sul vivo perché si, si comincia a cominciare a chiedere loro io gli ho proprio fatto prendere in mano il cellulare gli ho chiesto di guardare quante ore passano sui social, che cosa mettono sui social eh, e quindi eh, abbiamo proprio parlato di come eh, ci sia di fatto un'intromissione nelle nostre vite, ma forse anche perché lo vogliamo noi in qualche caso. Quindi sicuramente è un bellissimo approccio, un bellissimo taglio, partire da Orwell e da quello che lui ci dice. Poi ecco, questo sarebbe un romanzo da leggere tutto, ovviamente eh, sappiamo tutti che il tempo in classe eh, non è infinito, quindi eh, spesso scegliamo dei passaggi. 
eh, ma leggere eh, i pezzi, i brani in cui anche solo lui tiene il suo diario segreto eh, piuttosto che eh, lui guarda fuori dalla finestra e vede gli elicotteri passare e dice non sono questi quelli di cui preoccuparsi, bisogna preoccuparsi della Thought Police, eh, sicuramente far capire ai ragazzi che certo noi non abbiamo gli elicotteri che passano fuori dalla finestra, ma, eh, ma eh, come si dice, eh, abbiamo comunque chi eh, ci, ci controlla, diciamo, e i ragazzi su questo hanno dav da davvero tantissimo da dire. Eh, è venuto fuori proprio tutto un discorso e magari potete farlo anche voi in classe ehm, eh, su eh, chi ha in casa Alexa, Alexa e Google Home e eh, questo è stato un discorso bellissimo, io non me lo aspettavo, è partito da loro e, e quindi ehm, ci siamo raccontati di come in America alcune registrazioni fatte con Alexa e con Google Home siamo, siano state utilizzate in processi quindi eh, anche parlando di un liceo delle scienze umane eventualmente eh, parlando con i colleghi di diritto, eccetera, eccetera, è un bellissimo filone, a partire proprio da Orwell, una cosa super contemporanea come Alex e Google Home che abbiamo in casa. Allora, intanto continuano spunti <ride> sulla chat di YouTube, Silvia. Allora, una richiesta di precisazione. Which are the main differences between dystopian and science fiction novels? Uh, uh, allora... Eh, la maturità. <ride> Eh, allora, intanto devo dire che science fiction, eh, non lo so, poi magari voi avete esperienze differenti, quindi potrete scriverlo in chat così eh, ci confrontiamo anche su questo. Eh, science fiction è, mh, di solito è una, una, una cosa che trattiamo, eh, ma eh, trova i ragazzi o completamente pro o completamente contro. Quindi eh, magari appunto la vostra esperienza è diversa, io ho avuto alcune difficoltà magari a utilizzarlo in classe, perché c'è qualcuno a cui piace tantissimo e qualcuno a cui non piace. Uh, Dystopian alla fine ci parla di un futuro, il futuro peggiore possibile, science fiction invece abbiamo tantissimi elementi science uh, dentro, dentro una fiction, <ride> dentro uh, un romanzo. Uh, sicuramente ci sono lavori a livelli diversi che si possono fare, um, sì appunto su livelli uh, differenti, uh, alcuni comuni, altri... Um, come si dice, altri differenti, io credo eh, per la mia esperienza che eh, science fiction sia un tantino più difficile da approcciare, però ecco sarò felice di leggere commenti contrari perché appunto dico è sempre bello confrontarsi e, e imparare qualcosa di nuovo. Di solito loro venendo anche magari da un background di letteratura italiana eccetera eccetera con utopia, dystopian sono più... Uh, sono più mh, hanno più familiarità ecco però magari appunto è proprio solo stata la mia esperienza no c'è di nuovo c'è una testimonianza di una tua collega Silvia in chat che dice dystopian fiction usually proves more engaging eh, quindi, <ride> okay. è una, una questione che risuona anche in altre dipende, dipende da classe a classe sappiamo tutti che magari una cosa con una classe funziona e con quella dopo assolutamente no allora, qualcuno ci chiede come, quindi se hai un'idea di planning o se invece tu fai, eccetera, uh, how can you show the movies you mentioned in a school year? Magari non è in a school year, magari, oh, e, e, e c'è anche un pezzo di risposta, forse sono su, uh, sufficienti trailers di alcuni di questi, più o meno come ti regoli in pratica? Allora, io di solito faccio almeno un film dalla prima alla quarta, un film all'anno, eh, tendenzialmente dalla terza in poi legato alla letteratura. Uh, in quinta eh, ho deciso questa cosa, ho azzardato questa cosa un po' di anni fa, eh, siccome vado per unità tematiche non tanto cronologiche, poi seguono una sorta di cronologia, però è più un approccio tematico, un film per ogni unità tematica. Quindi guardiamo, quando facciamo il romanticismo e trascendentalismo americano, guardiamo ehm, un film, poi va, varia a seconda degli anni, eh, dipende anche dalle classi, da cosa hanno visto o no, a volte Into the Wild, a, vol a volte abbiamo guardato anche eh, Into Thin Air, no, Into Thin Air è il, è il romanzo, forse si chiama Everest, il, um, il film, quando parliamo di guerra guardiamo The Monuments Man, oppure quest'anno abbiamo guardato 1917, oppure Dunkirk, eh, quando parliamo di America, eh, io a volte faccio vedere The Butler, mm -hmm. eh, altrimenti è capitato che guardassimo anche Selma, eh, sicuramente in quinta non manca mai The Help, eh, e poi faccio, quando parlo di Orwell faccio vedere le vite degli altri. Lo so, si spende tanto tempo, 
Eh, però ho capito che, eh, vabbè, a parte sappiamo tutti che i ragazzi amano vedere i film, eh, ma magari fermandosi qua e là e con, facendo rimandi dal film alla letteratura, dalla letteratura al film, è un modo ulteriore per fargli capire che la letteratura, come dicevo prima, non è morta e sepolta lì, ma comunque ha ancora attinenza, anche cose scritte tanti anni fa, hanno ancora attinenza con quello che sta succedendo adesso. O comunque con la società in cui erano inseriti, perché parlando di letteratura di guerra, poi eh, non dico niente perché abbiamo già fatto tutto un incontro solo sulla letteratura di guerra, parlando di letteratura di guerra è molto bello vedere quello che loro leggono nelle poesie di Sassoon, Brooke, eccetera, eccetera, vederlo nei film perché ti fa capire che era una cosa reale, oppure leggere i diari o sentire le, le registrazioni radio dei, 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 dei soldati al fronte, quindi è una cosa che ti fa capire che la letteratura è lì, c'è, è viva, non è, è una cosa altra rispetto alla società in cui è inserita. Allora, domanda più, più facile. <ride> allora, is a gaming lab quiz uh, heavy to be prepared? No, assolutamente no. Uh, game lab, uh, allora... Dei tre che vi ho fatto vedere, forse Game Lab è il, è il più macchinoso, mettiamola così, perché, però una volta presa la mano poi, poi va da sé, eh, perché bisogna appunto capire un attimino come funziona, bisogna scegliere quale gioco eh, utilizzare, come vi dicevo prima ci sono tantissime varietà, si va da quello per la scuola elementare, quindi semplicemente che ne so, abbina i disegni, eh, a cose più complesse tipo il mio ciclista che ho fatto schiantare contro il muro piuttosto che altre cose come SimCity oppure Candy Crush eh, bisogna inserire le domande bisogna pianificare le risposte bisogna dirgli se la domanda la vogliamo una volta due volte ripetuta eccetera eccetera però poi una volta imparato a usare devo dire che assolutamente non porta via tempo mentre gli altri due sono veramente di immediato utilizzo anche la prima volta che aprite il sito Uh, sia Mentimeter che, che l'altro Flippity, in dieci minuti riuscirete a organizzare il vostro gioco okay. Allora, ultima, ultima domanda per te Silvia, che, che appunto è una, forse una curiosità, do you do Virginia Woolf and the film The Hours? Mi è capitato di proporlo? Sì, ma siccome dico la verità, io non riesco a vedere quel film <ride> non l'ho più proposto no, sì, allora lavoriamo su Virginia Woolf, lavoriamo eh, più diciamo da un punto di vista dell'innovazione stilistica ecco su Virginia Woolf eh, ho fatto vedere il film adesso è un po' di anni che non lo faccio vedere più ma per colpa mia non per colpa dei ragazzi quindi insomma quando l'insegnante può decidere insomma, ogni tanto è dovuto anche questo senti Silvia come sempre ti ringrazio tanto e grazie a voi grazie a menti che poi potrai leggere rivedendo appunto i commenti che sono stati scritti in chat ci sono stati appunto molti bei suggerimenti dati dati gli uni agli altri e di cui noi terremo traccia perché <ride> andrò a leggerli tutti fonti di buone idee quindi ringrazio tutti ti ringrazio davvero per aver aperto e chiuso questo nostro primo anno eh, di Le Lingue Live spero che, so che sarai dei nostri quindi ti ringrazio ancora e... grazie a chi ci ha ascoltato ha avuto la grazie. pazienza di ascoltarci e grazie per i suggerimenti che poi andrò a leggere tutti quanti buona serata a tutti arrivederci